I didn't get one of those hats. I got that sweater, but I don't got that hat. I'm going to have to get on to my boys now to send me a hat, dude. Yeah, it's got the 20 on it. Dude, oh, I don't got – I don't – dude, i never seen the one with the 20 except on race day. Shit. That's it. I'm going to have to get one, bro. That's all there is. That's tough. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Blacktop Banter, episode 19, I believe. I'm, I'm losing track as we're getting going here, but uh, I got to give a shout out right away to Jason Mann. Um, that dude's been supporting me ever since I started YouTube videos and things, and they're out there killing it out on the East Coast, and I wish them nothing but the best. And today I got a guest. You know, it's been kind of easy to nab some guests because I know they're at their houses, and I know if I hit them up, their chances are they're going to look at their phone. And uh, we got one today in Spencer Boyd Jr. Spencer competes full-time in the NASCAR Gander RV and Outdoor Series, driving the number 20 Chevy Silverado. And then also as well, let's just add to more accolades for this fella. He competed in Monster Energy Series, obviously, and the Xfinity Series. Spencer, how's it going, man? It's good, man. Quarantine life. <laughs> <laughs> how's that been affecting you, quarantine life? What have you been up to? Oh, man. Well, no racing, uh, no hanging out with the fans. So, uh, racing here at the house and uh, just doing a lot of crazy stuff, having fun, uh, shooting guns, and uh, <laughs> just enjoying myself. I, I guess it's a second off season right now, but uh, we have a long season, 10 months long normally. Um, so enjoying this break, but can't wait to get back. Yeah, I, mean, I know you mentioned, um, you know, online racing and stuff. Tell us about it. What, tell me what it's like. Tell me, the, like, the difference. Obviously, there's a huge difference, you know, in one that you're yeah. not really there. But well, what's it like? It doesn't hurt when you hit the wall, and uh, your wallet doesn't get smaller and smaller throughout the weekend. But uh, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Uh, these simulators have come a long way in the last you know ten fifteen years. Uh, I had a simulator called iRacing uh, online, iRacing.com, and anyone can go join. You can do it from your you know Apple laptop at the house, or you can have some extravagant simulators. So. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a simulator. It's full motion. It moves. Uh, it tries to uh, replicate it as much as possible. Um, nowadays, you don't really get to go test, especially uh, with quarantine. So uh, racing online, but like you said, man, uh, that reset button is a miracle button right there. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you get hooked up with that thing, like the, the simulator? How did that happen? Yeah, man. Uh, well, iRacing, like I said, you can do it on anything, you know, laptop with just a, you know, Logitech, oh, okay. $300 steering wheel, or you can go like all the way to the other end. And uh, there's some really high dollar stuff. I got middle of the road, um, yeah, simulator, uh, steering wheel pedals. So it's like hydraulic uh, pedals. So they feel uh, like 300 pounds per inch of brake pressure. So Really realistic, I guess, is That's what you're crazy, shooting for. Dude. That's crazy to think that they go from that spectrum to another spectrum. I need one of those for a seal coating. That way my guys aren't so rusty when we get going in the summer. Dude, I'll just have them seal coating all summer. Dude, their arms will be so tired from that simulator. That, that's a good idea. Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to sell a lot of them, but, you know, hey. it is what it is. With, what's that? Go ahead. We'll have a school for it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Maybe we'll be able to keep guys fresh. And you know what that would help with is the new guys. Because, man, it takes a while for them to get caught up to what we're doing. You know, usually they're covered in sealer once or twice before they realize I should stay away from that, you know, or not do it that way next time, you know. So when, it, when they're getting sprayed and it's changing the color of their skin, you know, it's like, ah, all right, we're, we're going to figure out a better way to do this. So maybe, maybe I need to come up with a simulator, man. You never know with me. So when – one thing I want to ask you about, obviously, quarantine's been affecting you where you got to be – you know, you're racing online. I know you and I were talking. You're doing some home projects and stuff like that. I think everybody – dude, the interior of everyone's house should look fantastic and the exterior a little bit if you have yeah. some property and stuff, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, I want to know kind of – obviously, the connection to you – from you to us and in our industry is when you raced in Vegas and, uh, you know, APS sponsored the number 20. And those dudes had a great time. I talked to them about it. They loved every bit of it. Um, tell us about how you got started, though. I, if I do my homework correctly, you're a Missouri boy, right? I am, yeah. All right, all right. All right. Grew up uh, just outside of St. Louis. And, um, you know, everyone there is uh, – it's all about baseball, right? Uh, right. Grow up, it's all about baseball. I played my fair share and uh, just wasn't into the team sports. Uh, my Being an only child, 
Um, you know, I was used to, you know, I'm not going to say used to being by myself, but, you know, um, I kind of like that. Uh, my parents were into dirt bikes and four wheelers and got me into dirt bikes when I was four years old and <laughs> started racing those and everyone was getting hurt. And my mom was like, ah, we might want to go a different direction. And I'm pretty sure that conversation was with my dad. And uh, next thing you know, a go-kart showed up and I'm just, you know, five-year-old kid like, yeah, let's, I'm doing this now. So yeah. uh, had some instant success on a go-kart and uh, my dad was setting it up and uh, we were just having fun. And my dad had, has an engineering uh, background. So uh, traveled all over the country and uh, that led to winning races. And that really just, you know, like anything, if you're hitting home runs at seven years old or you're winning races, typically that's going to be uh, what you chase. Cool, dude. Well, I know my little guy just got his first dirt bike. Uh, he's nine. So, you know, he, uh, I, I figured within two or three hours, we were going to have our first wreck, dude. Like, we, we raced through the woods on our property and stuff. And sure enough, dude, like, two hours into it, he's like, build me a jump. So I built him just a little, dude, a little tiny one, maybe a foot. But he hit it full throttle like he was uh, Travis Pastrana, bro. And he landed it. And when he did, he whiskey throttled. And that thing hit a tree. He had all this gear on, but it hit a tree, and it broke the front fork and put the tire right up in the header. And uh, he was like, he bought the bike itself, dude, so I'm really proud of him. But he was like, how much is it going to cost to fix this? And I was like, it's probably going to be a couple hundred bucks, dude. And he's like, I'm going to be bankrupt. I'm going to be bankrupt. <laughs> you know, he was just, he, he was so he hard. Business. He was, he was. I said, now you learn, dude. Now you learn to take it easy a little bit on that. But, uh, you know, it's a great thing for him and I to, to do. And, I, you know, talking about your dad setting everything up and doing everything. It's really family oriented. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing. When did you get that call, dude, where all of a sudden, I'm sure you went to like local tracks first right and then all of a sudden you got a call to go up to what we would consider the big leagues I'm guessing and uh, what was that like that feeling dude when that first hit oh uh, it's pretty wild man uh, you know I was uh, racing all over the country and racing late models I talked my parents into moving out to North Carolina uh, when I was 14 that's kind of like the hub of, of racing and uh, moved out here and you know fought really hard my parents uh, put everything they could into you know getting to the racetrack and racing you know, two, three times a week. Uh, it's pretty expensive. Um, but, you know, they knew that, um, hey, you know, we keep investing in this. Uh, there's a possibility you might be able to make it and uh, really appreciate their sacrifices. And, uh, you know, here we are. So uh, pretty cool. When I was 20 is when I kind of got that, like, you know, hey, uh, let's go do this truck race. The opportunity came about. A driver wasn't uh, able to run that race. And, that's kind of how it works. Um, you know, when you look at baseball and other big sports, there's so many like opportunities, so many teams and NASCAR, uh, you got 32 trucks out there. That's not a lot of opportunities. So uh, you're waiting on someone to get sick or hurt. <laughs> Dude, that's crazy to think about. Cause there has to be a, t I mean, like, you know, you guys moved out there. There has to be a good group of people out there that are trying to chomp at the bit to get an opportunity like that. I would imagine. So, you know, it's just crazy to think about. Pretty well. Man, so so when when you did get there and you started finding some success, I know um going on go, got it going on. What was it like? Was there a different feeling? Like when you got there, was there a different feeling like oh you know, what was you like, oh my god, dude, we're here? Or was it <laughs> or, or were you like so focused on doing good that like it zoned out? Oh man, I, I wish I could say I was just zoned in. Uh, I got pictures on my phone. Uh, crazy. I, I still have the same iPhone from my first NASCAR race four years ago. <laughs> so all the pictures, I got like 30,000 pictures. And, uh, you know, I took pictures of Dale Jr. and Kyle Busch walking down pit road at the same time I was because, you know, those are names that you hear growing up. And, um, you know, for me, I'm like, wow, the fact I'm even like allowed to be here, uh, I'm not wearing street clothes. Like, and uh, I'm getting ready to go race Kyle Busch here in 30 minutes. I'm like, this is insane. And, you know, after a while, uh, I'm not going to lie, you kind of get numb to that. Like, uh, you know, hey, you appreciate what you're doing. But then, like you said, you kind of get focused. Um, you settle in. You settle you in. Realize, right? Yeah, you settle in. You realize uh, yeah, it takes a couple races to kind of feel like, hey, I belong. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is uh, at first – you're super excited and you can't believe it. And then you're like, okay, like, how do I stay here? How do I stay relevant? <laughs> uh, you know, what is going to make someone remember Spencer Boyd? And, uh, you know, when you break into NASCAR, you're not always competing for wins uh, mm -hmm. right out of the gate. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty competitive business. So uh, you're trying to find ways to differentiate yourself from other drivers. And um, you know, it's about the same time social media was, was taken off. And uh, you watch all these different industries 
uh, the guys that adapt to social social media and embrace those fans, they're going to succeed. So I think you see that from sports on into business. Yeah, and, that, and I know for like for us in our industry to even know that we had a company that we know sponsor a car and it be on there and I see it going around the track and stuff was just it was mind numbing mind boggling to see that so we appreciate your team you know taking them on and uh putting raised on blacktop and APS on there because we know those guys are stellar and uh it's still that was surreal for us you know like oh my god dude to have that I want to ask you about um so I used to race now I race quads and we raced on ice up here yeah. I know dude it was wild so there was two types. One was studded tires, and then one was just rubber tires, like paddle tires. I raced those ones. So top speed, I was really screaming at 45 mile an hour, bro. I was just, let me tell you. But we did oval and we did TT, and um, I loved both of them. I actually won the championship series in, in novice class in the oval, and then TT, I got a bad wreck the last race, and it cost me a championship. I got second. But oh, anyways, wow. I want to ask you about, like, the groove the flow i know you know what i'm talking about is that is is that does that still exist in nascar when you're going around because there's a time where i'm when i was there dude i was at complete peace because there's nothing to think about except making sure you're maintaining is that th does that still exist up there 100 percent, man uh you're always you know chasing that feel and that rhythm and you know the track obviously like same word you use you know you have a groove like uh obviously the track could be you know seven race cars wide or whatever um mm -hmm. you're not going to just pick a lane you're going to you know kind of just go back and forth and keep your momentum up and there's spots where there's obviously some of these racetracks are 40 years old haven't been paved yet you yeah, know yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know you've got to be on the bottom or hey like when the tires wear you got to get up to the top and it looks like a completely different race you're running around you know six inches off the wall and just you know 20 mm -hmm. laps ago you were down on the bottom on the white line uh, we call that painting the, painting the line but um you know it's crazy uh every track is different asphalt um i hate concrete tracks so that was kind of our first conversation with america we do too, dude we do too. we hate them too bro <laughs> that's right man those guys are so much fun hanging out in vegas at the race and, and look forward to doing more and they're big needle movers uh, in the industry but yeah. um it was fun learning about you know asphalt and how it works because i just know it's either good or it's bad in my world <laughs> right, right, right well uh that's kind of what i was going to ask you about was um like like pavement differences so i'm, I'm sure at all kinds of places i you had i, I know you won at talladega right yeah. so that's a crazy iconic place to win a race hands down anyways but i know where talladega is that pavement is hot, you know, and it's, and it's very wide. Obviously there's a lot of blacktop there, man. So, you know, the, I'm, I imagine in different places, the pavement is different. What, how much does the pavement and what it is, like you were just talking about concrete, obviously tell us why you hate racing on concrete, but then also what are the pavement differences in different places? How does that affect you on race day? Yeah. Well, first off, um, you know, the biggest thing that you're going to look at is temperature. Uh, like you said, so temperature on asphalt obviously fluctuates a lot more than concrete. Um, so I like that. You know, you like that the groove uh, where everyone's running. So if there's 32 trucks running like within, you know, 10 feet of the racetrack, that's a lot of tires. That's a lot of heat getting put down. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the race goes on, you can move up the racetrack to kind of escape that heat. Yep. Let that cool back down, go up to cool asphalt. And everyone's going to be up here. And then 20 laps later, it's like the speed's back down here. Where on concrete, it's like you run the same lane yeah. all day, every day. Doesn't matter if it's 30 degrees in the morning in Tennessee or 60 degrees in Dover, Delaware. They race the same. And it's really hard to pass. So I was going to say, everyone's fighting for that same lane then most of the time, right? Exactly. If you're constantly fighting for the same lane, then you can't pass. It's like driving down two lane road versus the interstate. You want to have options. You know? Yeah. So qualifying comes in a lot more effect on concrete surfaces, I would imagine, versus pavement. You can fight a little bit on pavement, you know, but exactly, concrete. it's the best. It's the best. Yeah. And then when it gets hot and slippery, then uh, it's just who's got the biggest kahunas at that yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, I imagine so, bro. I imagine so. But on on virtual racing. 
you don't really got to worry about that much, you know? Well, you, you everyone's know. a hero on virtual <laughs> I was going to say, you, you know what it probably does is let you really see people's personalities, you know? Like, dude, if, we had, if, if you could just not worry about anything, how would you race? And I got to imagine everyone up there is like, all right, we're just going to, we're just going to roll with it. You know? I, I'd have a few uh, attempted black eyes at this point because <laughs> uh, I'm ready to throw hands. Some of my buddies that we race really good together, like, you know, not saying we give each other room, but like we can race each other hard and you're, you're trustworthy. That's what you're right, looking for. Right. Then you get on the game and it's like, you totally just ran me over. Like, I want to kick your butt, dude. Like, <laughs> when we get back to the real world, I'm not giving you an inch, so hopefully all that washes away. Because right now my list, uh, my list of people to wreck is long. <laughs> oh my God, I can't. Believe it. Well, well, uh, what about like I was going to ask you? Oh, new pavement versus old pavement, like yeah. uh, you know, because obviously some of these tracks get repaved at some point. Um, I, I would imagine like you're 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 your tact and the way that you want to go your plan of attack changes if it's if it's new pavement versus old pavement is that right or do you just do it the same is there a difference between those two yeah well i mean i think you guys probably have a better idea like for me when you look at asphalt when it's super fresh mm -hmm. like obviously first year and we go racing when it gets hot those like chemicals and stuff come up right, right. and it gets really slippery um year two three four it's wicked fast I mean, uh, new asphalt is super fast. And then as it ages, um, it starts getting character. That's what we call it. Um, you can start moving around and racing. So uh, whenever someone says, you know, we're going to repave this place, everyone's like, oh, man, racing's not going to be as good for, you know, a couple of years there. But you got to put in time. And then it depends where it is in the country, right? If they're getting snow, is it going to get weathered? Mm -hmm. um, are there other events that take place there to kind of wear that down? Sure. But do you, are there certain tracks that have – you know, not so much features, obviously Pocono or, or some of the road courses have different turns and different things. And then some of the bigger ones, you know, like Talladega, um, you know, it's obviously known for being able to go so, so damn wide and pass if you can, if you got the cojones like you're talking about. <laughs> but um, is there certain tracks where the pavement has a defect where you're like, oh, you know, or not, maybe not so much a defect, but just a memorable section of it where you're like oh we got to remember you if you go there there's a crack in it or there's a, a different change of elevation or anything or are they all pristine oh uh, not at all they're not pristine and, and that's what makes the track so unique um tell you like you got your notebook I, i've been doing this four years now um so my notebook's pretty pretty good um but then you look at those guys that have been doing it 10 15 and it's like they got just filing cabinets of you know what these tracks do um when you look at Atlanta, no one wants it repaved. I mean, like, there's, like, protest against really? repaving it. It's super old, slippery. Um, it's, like, really coarse. Um, so tire wear is high. I mean, right. from running a lap, like, with fresh sticker tires, brand new, to 10 laps later, um, you're going to run, like, a second slower. And, and that's pretty wild. But then you go out to a place like California – um that track is really smooth everywhere except the back stretch and there's been like some settling yeah um so it's really bumpy like some of us wear a mouth guard there because uh, you're like it we've had drivers like lose fillings Damn. in their team like really? just uh Damn. and their seams so the track's super wide yep. and then you're out in the california sun yep. uh so those seams they get really hot and slippery. So when you watch a car go through there, if you watch a driver's hands, he's going to like drive off in 205 mile an hour and then just. Oh my God. All the way, and then you get to the straightaway and it's like, all right, cool. And then, you know, it's right back to it. Um, so like you said, uh, so many tracks have different characteristics and, and Talladega, it's like smooth as butter, man. I love it. Dude, what was that like when you got the win there? Cause dude, that's a long race, man. And no matter what. No matter what series you're in, that's a long race. What was it like, dude, when you were like, dude, I did it? It was so cool, man. Uh, so many of my partners were there. My mom and dad were there. Uh, they don't get oh, to go to the race. So, that's yeah, special. it was special. Damn. Uh, special for sure. But uh, really cool. Uh, like you said, historic track to win at. Um, those races, I mean, you're side by side, inches apart, doing, you know, 190 to 200 mile an hour for a few hours. So, um, it's fun. When those races are over, you're like, even if you just finish 10th, you're like, all right, like, I'm ready to, like, drink some soda and, like, get rid of this headache and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. relax for a second. And then 
Uh, but I felt like I could race all day after we won. I was like, I bet, dude, you were on cloud nine, bro. You're so I was on cloud nine. They're bringing over moonshine and victory lane. It was, it was wild. You're like, yeah, the car was perfect. You know, the truck, the car was, the truck was perfect. Let's just keep going. We don't yeah. want to stop. It was, it was felt perfect, you know? So yeah. that's crazy. We, we went to my family and I seal master, uh, sent us to a uh, Indy car race last year. And, uh, my boy was first time dude. we got to sit down in it and, uh, you know, the owner was there. One of the owners was like, yeah, this is what we do. This is why we put the spoiler on for this way. And I had never been around IndyCar. You know, I was a NASCAR fan for a long time and I raced. Everything I ever raced had more than one lug nut, man. So it was just yeah. like, it was insane to see the efficiency and quickness that those guys can do, especially with the one lug, obviously. But the control, you know, the, the steering wheel being a computer itself was just mind numbing to me and to think about all the specs because when we were, dude, when I raced, sometimes dude it was just push more gas now you know what i mean or just hold your brake a little longer than somebody else and now dude they're getting information overload that's why they're pilots dude you know and you guys same at same as same thing when you're out there spencer i want to ask you like do you make decisions on your own like it's time to go back down to the bottom or does your crew chief do it do you guys how do you how does that play back back, back and forth with you know, to essentially those, those are two alphas, dude, that the driver and, and the chief. And I know it makes a big, a big difference if you guys communicate well, but do you talk about that real quick or you, or, or do you guys just be like, well, yo, it's time. And you just go, or someone says, do it. And you just go down. How does that dynamic work? Cause I've always wondered, that's a crazy dynamic I imagine between <laughs> two people. Yeah. I mean, I think the driver's got to have that feel. Um, you're constantly chasing grip. Um, that's kind of what the whole race is about. You know, speed is finding grip. So chasing that up and down the racetrack, you got to have an idea of like, Hey, this track, you know, watch some races previously. It tends to do this and mm -hmm. kind of have like that common sense, like approach. Right. And then if you're not doing it and, uh, you know, you're losing time or everyone's moving to the top and you're running the middle, you know, your crew chief might come over and be like, yo, um, what are you doing, boy? Everyone else is up top. <laughs> Why are we not up top? And then it's like, then you key up the mic and they're like, no, no, no. That was us telling you to get to the top. Don't tell us why. Right. <laughs> just, just get up, up. there. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, you know, you communicate well. Um, you really got to put, you know, motion to the side and strictly just sit there and analyze everything. You're analyzing your speed, uh, what the spotter and the crew chief are saying. You know, they're giving you some advice every now and then, or they're just going to reiterate like that was good move. You know, right. that's perfect. All right. This is perfect time. You know, you're, and they're telling you your lap time. Sure. Um, so, you know, any car, they can see their lap time um, within the race car. Yep. We can't, so our spotter has to tell us that. Yep. And that's the biggest thing. Sometimes a spotter will give you your lap time at the start-finish line, like cross it, boom, 31.27, and you're like, sweet. Then you may have a spotter that tells you on the backstretch. And I hate that because then, like, you start getting confused. Like, okay, I did this in this corner. Because you're constantly, like I said, chasing. Right, you're already on to the next one you're already on to the next lap. It's like, well, what did I do that time that was faster in turns one? So yeah. communication's key. If, if you're firing on all eight, you'll be good. Well, I got to imagine, dude, at, at Talladega, that's probably fairly easy. At Dover, you're doing – or Bristol, dude, you're, go, you're going like oh. this. So I can't um, – uh, is it has to be immensely important for the spotter to be like, yo, now, 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 because you you got short time to make another lap up, right? Yeah, Bristol is so small. Half the field pits on the front stretch, and then the other half of the field pits on the back stretch. So, right. like, when you're green flag and they say, okay, you know, we need to do a green flag pit stop, it's like, am I pitting off of turn two or off of turn four? <laughs> and you start, you're, like, getting confused because you, you you're do another lap to ask. Like, you know, where, yeah. which one am I on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, literally, they're like, okay, we're pitting in 10, 9, 8. Oh, I mean, really? Uh, a lap at Bristol is 14 seconds. Yeah, man. That's crazy. So it's, when, when, you, when you are getting your lap times in, does it, you know, because obviously you know what a good lap time should be probably at every track, I'm guessing. So when you get a lap time, are you like, oh, we got to adjust this. We got to have to fix this because you felt it while you were driving. Is that yeah, I mean, uh, without knowing your lap time, like you can pretty much tell like, ah, you know, I have speed or I don't have speed. And then, you know, the lap time is going to be like, okay, like how far off are we? Because sometimes the truck feels really good mm -hmm. and they're like, bud, you're half second off. And you're like, oh, truck feels too good. All right, let me go. You know, you got to drive harder. You can't drive for comfort. You got to drive for speed. 
uh, and the speed is being uncomfortable. So that's the difference between one driver and the next is, you know, how long and how far can they go uncomfortable? Um, and, and that's what we're chasing. And, and you're adjusting the vehicle to fit those needs better. You know, hey, if I'm getting loose, getting into the corner, we need to adjust some stuff in the rear suspension mm-hmm. and get it better and better. But then at the same time, like you said, the asphalt's changing throughout the race. So, uh, Dude, temperature is from qualifying day to race day, temperatures change a lot, you know? So it's like yeah. but the whole condition could change at that point. But the good thing is it probably changes for everybody, you know? And, and you, got some, you got some wise people on your team to make those adjustments and do those things that bring it all to give you your best darn shot, you know, at that point, obviously. So I want, that's kind of what, what I want to lead into is, um, what obviously we're dealing with quarantine and and you're in the off season you know that that we've been talking about yeah dude I hate saying the word anymore dude I just want it to be over with so we can I know you want to get back at it we want to get back at it we're we're able to do what we do but it's not quite the same you know and I want to know kind of what the future holds you know because not only you know for yourself obviously I want to know but like for racing in general because we're doing digital stuff you know, we're watching digital races, man, which is maybe that's the way it is one day, but I hope not, dude. I, I miss the smell of the race fuel. I miss the burning rubber. I miss all that stuff. So um, what's the future hold for Spencer Boyd? And then what's the future hold do you see for racing in general here coming up? Yeah, things look good. Um, you know, they, NASCAR just announced um, our first race back in trucks is going to be uh, May 26th at Charlotte right here in our backyard. So uh, no fans at that race going to be a little odd, but at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of people at home, a lot of people out of work. Um, they need something positive. They need something to watch. You know, sports bring a lot of people together, whether you're a NASCAR fan or basketball. Uh, you need something to talk about. That water cooler talk is important. Uh, so we're excited to get back. Uh, obviously, TV numbers should be high. Uh, NASCAR is excited. Uh, we got some great partners on board. Uh, looking forward to the rest of the season. Um, hopefully, some of these other tracks will open up. You know, it's kind of like state dependent currently yeah. oh yeah um, for sure for sure but, uh, we'll see what happens I don't think we'll be in Michigan anytime soon but um <laughs> we'll we'll see what happens you know uh states are opening up things look a little better but you're right man I'm tired of the quarantine word um everyone thought it would be cool to work from home like that's I grew up listening to that man I wish I could work from home when I get older I want to work from home then you're stuck at home for two months and you're like, I'll do anything. Get me on an oil rig out off the coast like I gotta yeah. get out of here <laughs> yeah man I had somebody call me they were asking about something. They're like, I'm, we're sh- I'm sure you're enjoying your time home with your family. We don't want to bother you. And I said, I've seen these people for two months every day straight. Like, get, I'll do whatever I got to do to get out of here. I don't care what it is. It's, I love them. But, man, I need, to, I need to see somebody else. A different human would be great at this point. And luckily, Wisconsin's been um, fairly decent, you know, where we have a longer stay-at-home order. But our business is listed as essential. So we've been able to get out and do some stuff. And uh, – just keep my guys busy and keep our sanity, man, because it's, it's created times like this, which is unique because you and I get to talk. We both have time to do this kind of thing right now, but yet we, what we really want to do our passions and stuff like let's, you know, we, all right, we've had enough time. Let's get back out and do it. So we're really excited dude, to, to see you get back out there. Um, I appreciate your time. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing as far as, uh, you know, yourself or racing or whatever in general? Uh, we, I usually let somebody say whatever they like to. Everyone has their own motto and their own creed or they have their own thing. So what do we know about Spencer Boyd? What could be the last word if you had one? Yeah, man. Well, I uh, appreciate you having me on and uh, appreciate American Pavement uh, kind of introducing me to uh, this industry and, and everything going on. I uh, appreciate what all you guys do. Everyone in paving, uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully going up there and uh, enjoying a day, uh, learning some more about asphalt, getting my hands and boots dirty. But uh, I'll let you professionals do it. Uh, Stay safe out there. Keep grinding. And uh, if you cruise through North Carolina, help our roads out. Dude, uh, dude, yeah, most definitely. Some of those roads, dude, are brutal. I've been through them. They're brutal. All right, that's it for the podcast, BB19. From myself and from Spencer, we want you to seal it, pave it, stripe it, and kill it. Peace.